Welcome to another episode of Get a Good Start. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Get a Good Start. Visit us on getagoodstart.com for the accompanying blog to this podcast, which provides additional information about my guests, links to the information we discuss, and ways you can put into action what we talk about here on the show so you can get a good start. For the past 40 years, I have called my next guest friend. For almost 25 years, most people have simply called him Dr. Dave, as he was the owner of a successful chiropractic and lifestyle practice in Clifton, New Jersey. And recently, he's using his experience and knowledge to help a company called Coda Staffing, helping medical institutions find great talent. Welcome to the show, Dr. David Moore. Dave, I also hear you're going back to school. Tell me about that. Absolutely. I'm the 50-year-old freshman. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, besides starting a new career in staffing, helping um, helping medical uh, clinics uh, staff their, their staff, uh, medical assistants all the way on up to doctors, started seminary school. Just uh, I always just believe it's always good to be the consummate student. Um, it's important. Uh, I, never, I never consider myself an expert because when you think you're an expert, you, you, you think you know everything. So for me, I love being a student. I love learning. And I've always wanted to learn more uh, about the Bible. As a chiropractor, I've served people physically through adjusting them and uh, teaching them. So uh, now that I'm out of chiropractic, I'm uh, enjoying the process and the, and the possibility of being able to serve people on a more spiritual level. It's always been a passion of mine. And I said, you know what? It's never too late to learn something. And, uh, and, and that's why I love this show and, and what you're doing here, because it really is about that. Dave, you are a servant leader for sure. And uh, something that all my guests have had in common is that they are not defined by their title. Rather, they are just a leader by their actions. I think a lot of students listening could take away from this conversation. I know at the end that always improving yourself is very important. So let's jump right into it, Dave. What does getting a good start mean to you as it applies to your typical workday? Uh, great question, because I think that um, this is something that is, is a very important for, for anybody is having a, a great morning ritual. I'm an early riser, you know, early bird catches the worm. It's also, I have three kids you know, and, and it's a pretty busy household. So it's the one time like nobody's getting up early in my house, but me. So it's hmm. that quiet time for me. Uh, I, my ritual is very important. It's, it starts off with a little meditation and prayer, um, being in seminary school and reading the Bible, that sort of thing. Um, I also believe in affirmations. Uh, affirmations are very important. And I always ask people, do you do affirmations? And they may say yes or no. And I say, I bet you do. What's the first thing you think of Monday morning when you got to get out of bed? And it's usually like, oh, crap. <laughs> what do I got to do today? That's an affirmation, by the way. So if you can start to program your mind is to the questions or the things that you say to yourself in the morning, who you are, what you do, um, that's a, before you even step out of, out of bed, that's important. And that morning ritual is important. And you know, sometimes you miss it. And the days that I don't do my morning ritual, because I'm running around and I'm checking email or a text, I'm actually handing my day over to somebody else. So if you could start your day very intentional, very focused on who you are, uh, reminding yourself who you are, what your purpose is, and getting yourself in a good state energetically, um, then you will have a great day. If you could jump in a time machine and go back to 22-year-old Dr. Dave to get a better start to your career, what would you say? To you know, I first came out of school, uh, you had these ideas of what life was going to be like as a chiropractor. Um, and you planned and you almost had this like two year plan, three year plan, five year plan. Of, and I would say that having a plan is very important, but also realized all plans change. The plan is important because it's what you do when you don't have any other vision or, or clear mission involved. But realizing the miracles that have happened in my life are when the curveballs came in and we, I adapted to the change. So realizing you create a plan, but also realize that about, probably about 50% of that plan is going to get changed retrospectively, it was those changes that were out of my control and the ad adaptation of those change is when the miracles really happen. Like I said, it's looking back, it's those ch when those changes occurred are when, uh, you know, when life happens and, uh, and that's when the growth really occurs. Dave, thinking about back in college, going to go off and start your life and talking about that plan, what piece of advice do you wish someone had given to you? Well, I think the piece of advice actually stems right from the question. It is, in, it's, it is about mentors, right? So what I would do is if you are looking to get into a field, the best thing you possibly could do is find people that are doing it well while you're in school. Uh, people that are in your field love to give advice. 
You know, like, look at you and I, I'm 50 years old. We're all we do is give advice. We're dads, we're giving people advice. <laughs> and in our practice, especially, um, I always encourage students to come, chiropractic students to come to the office, you know, come check out, mirror us for the day, you know, and then stay connected to us. Let, let, me, get, let me help you avoid the pitfalls in life that I've had. I have wonderful mentors. I've had wonderful doctors that would invite me to their practice or old people I would spend time with at seminar, staying up, you know, after the seminar was over in the lounge at the hotel and just picking their brain. A Dr. Reggie Gold, who you see 2,000 patients a week in his practice. He was an icon in the profession. And I would just, you know, he got off stage and I followed him to the lobby and he was sitting there by himself. You know, like he just spoke to a thousand chiropractors and I'm like, you know, what? I'm not listening to the next speaker. I'm going to hang out with Reggie, you know? And I was just, I would ask him questions. How did you see 2000 people a week? And he was like, uh, one at a time. <laughs> was his advice. It was just simple. It was, you know, in the simplicity of that, it was just simple conversations with people. So, so the second piece to that, which I think is just as important as you start to develop and you start to grow and you start to succeed is to honor your mentors. Like I just mentioned Reggie Gold. I can mention mm -hmm. these Dr. Eric Plaster, Patrick Gentempo. These are mentors of mine that as people succeed, they, uh, they have this sense of maybe an ego thing where it'd be almost be like they figured it out themselves. And you know what? We stand on the shoulders of giants as you grow and you develop. I found the most successful mentors of mine always mention their mentors. Best, second best piece of advice besides getting a mentor or getting mentors is to honor those mentors. The piece of advice you wish you got was the importance of mentors and the importance of gratitude. Because I know both of those things are things that I learned from my mentor, Kevin Cummings, and from Ed Hershey and from Mike Reuter. They all talk about gratitude and that relationship that you build with what becomes a mentor, right? What has been a successful method maybe that you, you found in building or sparking that relationship with somebody like that doctor? It's just about humbly asking questions. Uh, if, if there's someone in the field, it's a book you read, it's a podcast you've watched. You, in your world, you may think that these, they're, they're giants, right? But they're not giants in the world. They're just giants in your world. So um, oftentimes I've reached out to people who've written books and say, I just really, your book was so, was so incredible to me. I got so much out of it. Do you mind if we, you know, I can, I can get you on the front of call. I mean, worst case scenario, they just say no. Somebody that's in my world could appreciate my passion to the point where you're teaching it and you're expressing it, especially when you're a student. If here's a, a giant in your profession or someone you absolutely respect. If you approach them humbly with respect, and say, I would just like five minutes of 10 minutes of your time. I could not think of a scenario where that person would say no. And that's the difference. Smart people make that initiative. And you know what? It's a very small percentage of people who do that. But I also tell you another thing, Scott, there's a very small percentage of people that actually get to the level of success that you want to get to. And it's usually the ones that come out of their comfort zone and will ask those questions. So connecting people, whether it's through an email, you know, if they don't get back to you right away, send another email. You know, it's sometimes they are busy people. Don't, they didn't reject you. Um, they're going to eventually, who is this annoying person? But you know what? That successful person was an annoying person when they were a student. And I guarantee <laughs> they found mentors. So you know what? They're going to see something in you. So it never hurts to try. And I've never, I've never seen a scenario in my profession anyway, uh, and many other things that uh, it's just being persistent and having the same passion for that person. Uh, and don't be afraid because the benefits are huge. Talking about the students, let's talk to the students for a second, Dave. Those medical students out there who are graduating are going to go open their own practice. What's a piece of advice you can give them about starting their own practice? Well, whether you're a medical student, chiropractic student, or uh, in this any kind of service industry, and I don't honestly don't see how this advice wouldn't just be be across the board. It's really about your connections. You know, it's really not about you. It's about them, especially in any type of service. You know, mm -hmm. it is not about you. It's not about them. I, you know, I remember being in wanting to become a chiropractor and visualizing like, you know, having a Range Rover and being a doctor and all this, like, you know, those eighties, you know, when you we're know, going back for so you just think like the, we called the Mercedes eighties, like to become a doctor, what that would look like, have a huge house, that sort of thing. And those are all things that are about you. You know, that's why I want to, you know, and I wouldn't say that was, you know, 
I don't know if I was able to identify with my true core values at that time, why I really wanted to be a doctor. It kind of revealed itself as time went on. And I will tell you, it's never, it's never been those things. You know, my core values are connect, lead and inspire. So if I can connect with somebody uh, and, and the information that I have, uh, whatever industry you're in could help uh, and serve somebody, you can lead them to make better choices, better decisions. In my, in my experience, it was about health and nutrition and those things, maybe down the road. It, and, and now it's more of staffing. How could I connect with doctors to understand their pain points, know about turnover in their practice and how it slows things down and, and it affects their rhythm and their ability to serve people. For me, it's always been about connecting, leading people through the through a process to get somebody here, and then really leaving them with some sort of inspiration. Success comes from, you know, it's, it's a paradox. You're not serving yourself, you're serving people. And when you're serving people, you get to live a wonderful life. And uh, it just, and, and if you can get that, you know, especially as a student, you know, not, you know, it's hard to see beyond what you have in front of you, or maybe the material successes of the, maybe your mentors, but it, why people become hugely successful is not for the stuff. You know, it's because they're gonna, because it's because of that return uh, they get was they connect with people, like I said, connect, lead and inspire. As far as being a doctor, you're building and maintaining relationships all day long besides just serving them. What is something that you found helps you develop and maintain patient relationships, essentially building customers for life. You know, I, I think I did kind of answer that question with as far as the uh, patients in the in the in that first question. But if I can really help the general audience out there, I think that when you grow a business in particular, uh, whether it's your patients or it's uh, or just growing your business, uh, we talk about networking and and connecting with other professionals and. Uh, I think it just comes from that that level of service. You know, I think about the Chamber of Commerce. I've been to a lot of those uh, Chamber of Commerce meetings or you network yourself and meet people. And uh, oftentimes I see people out there and they're just trying to give their cards out. And then they, or they'll, they'll take your cards and then like the next day they're calling you up and trying to sell you something. And, and I think it still speaks to that philosophy where it's about themselves. I think about my, my father-in-law who was, was not a doctor at all. He was, a, he was, a, he was a, bro from Brooklyn. Uh, he started a very uh, successful uh, sausage business, okay? A little cliche, Italian sausage, right? And uh, <laughs> Premio Sausage, if, uh, Premio Foods is a large, very large food company here in, in uh, really the whole East Coast. And I always th thought of his philosophy and he, he was a great salesman. And he built, he built a huge business, but it was really built on serving others. He would go to a restaurant, uh, a restaurant would just open up and he'd just start now. Like he would just, he would walk into, he would walk into the kitchen. <laughs> you just show up, who's the owner? Who's the, and it's usually the cook, the cook or something. He's like, hey, what kind of sausage do you use? Hey, I'm Joe Sausage. And he would just start to talk and, and talk about where they got their meat from and that sort of thing. And he would just kind of be larger than life. And then the next day, he had a great, great experience. He would connect with that, that owner. But uh, people knew that he went out to dinner every night. And people would call him on the beach. They'd be like, hey, Joey, where'd you go to dinner last night? He's like, listen, I got a great place. It's, you know, Joe's, you know, uh, Pizza Hut, whatever it was. He, he, goes, he goes, Joey, could you get me in? And he would say, Joe, tell him Joe's sauce had sent you. And he would send people to that restaurant all week. All week he would send them. He would show up the next week. And like, if there was a line at the door, the owner would come out bring us in, you know, give us the best table, right? He would sit down with us for half the meal. He would bring, they would bring out specialty things they were working on, right? Bring us free mm -hmm. dessert. I mean, the, the service he got and why I tell you this story is similar to the last question, right? If you're there, if you're there to try to help and serve others, you get that return. So same thing in practice, same thing with patients. It's like, how could you serve that person? You know, not how could I get to the next patient? How could I get more patients from this person? But listening to somebody uh, and then really trying to figure out what their pain spots are, listening to people, what they need, and is really delivering on a high level um, over the top, over the top experience. Go, beyond, go above and beyond what's expected in anything that you do and your return will, oh, it's a paradox. It's a paradox. It's not about how you can serve me. How could I serve you on a higher level? How could I blow you away, you know, with what was it, what you thought and what you expected and watch that energy return? You know, he was a, he was a loved man, you know, a loved man. Uh, 
And I think on some level, that's he, it's all, all he really wanted. You know, he always, always just wanted to have that connection with people to make somebody's day. And he was hugely successful in life. So I think that's an important thing to understand. There's a lot of paradoxes in business and life. What you think you're supposed to do, oftentimes it's not. And if you do the opposite, if you're, if you're a giver, you will receive above and beyond what you possibly could have ever dreamed of. Thinking about doing business, he reached out to people. He helped them succeed at their business before thinking about himself, right? I think you told me a story where he would walk into a networking event and instead of walking around handing out his card, he would ask everyone else for their card, right? He ne he never went to his life was a networking event. He never went to an event. He's just you know, <laughs> he would just bump into we would be just hanging out at the boardwalk, and some guy walking by, and he just start talking to him. What do you do? You're a plumber. You're oh, you're a plumber. Give me a card. Give me two. <laughs> and you know what? Give me them all. Right? He take them all. He would take them all. And then he like I mean, this is this is when he was in retirement. And then he would be like, "Hey, you need a plumber? I got a guy. You got to call him. Tell him Joe Saucer sent you. I got a guy." And I, and I, I call it "I got a guy" philosophy. He's I got a guy. He did. He had this guy. He and you know what? That guy appreciated business so much. And if I can, if this conversation, I think a lot of the questions kind of come back down to this. It's really about getting out of our own. What do I need? What am I trying to get out of this? Wanting to have those material things in life. But everybody focuses on the end result, but never takes the time to, to really work the pyramid, right? The pyramid starts with having a very clear philosophy of who you are, what you're going to do, right? Then it's the psychology around that, that emerges from your philosophy, right? So your philosophy is to serve, your philosophy is to, to connect, lead, and inspire, then it gives you the energy, like right? these affirmations and understanding, you know, who you are, what you do, why you want to get out there, why you want to serve, right? Then you'll create the procedures. Many people want to know how you did what you did to get what you got. But if you don't have those basic foundational premises in line to stimulate your psychology, then only then will those procedures even work. And then when you execute those procedures on a consistent basis, then you get the profit, then you get, you know, the, the end result that you're looking for. And most people have that pyramid upside down where they're going to get out of school because they want to make a lot of money, but mm. your pyramid is upside down. Think about mm. seminars you go to, right? The seminars is a lot of rah-rah and some procedures, okay? But if you don't have that foundational premise or your philosophy isn't set properly, then you can, you're, you'll never you're, you can get a lot of rah-rah, but then when the rah-rah goes away, you're out of gas. The only philosophy you have is you want to make money um, and you don't have a, and you're not really, you haven't done the work to understand who you are and why you want to do what you do. You'll never have that consistent energy waking up every day, loving who you are, loving what you're going to do. And if you're just chasing the dollar, I hate to say it, there's a good chance, it's a paradox. You're probably not going to get there. You know, right. you're probably, and if you do, it's going to be short lived. We're going to end on this. I think it's important for students to hear this. You have to build those the, your base of your pyramid like you're talking about. And I think if you do that good job of what you're describing, criticism will be easy to be to handle, right? And certainly in your field in chiropractic, I mean, people call you bone crackers and spine crackers. And the point I'm getting at is when students get out of school, they're going to be faced with criticism. How do you deal with criticism and overcome the naysayers? Um, I would say first and foremost is to um, not necessarily assume that people are going to criticize you. Okay. I think that's important because when you assume they're going to criticize you, someone's going to criticize you. Mm -hmm. And the more you get confident in what you do, I, I really don't experience that at all anymore. I, I was remember speaking at an, and I'm a very um, science-based person. So I hope I don't get too scientific about this, but I was doing a talk. We we're talking about nerves and the nervous system. And uh, now there's two kinds of nerves. There's nerves that are in the spinal cord that are unmyelinated, okay? Which means there's no electric cord around them, basically. And then there's the nerves that go out from the spinal cord to the arms and the legs and the periphery that has myelination, right? So my, um, being a, a science nerd, right? I was always wondering, is the pressure on a myelinated nerve or an unmyelinated nerve? If that sounded like mumbo jumbo to you, fine. Don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> so, but it was in the back of my mind. So I'm thinking to myself, well, what, what's the difference? Let me just give the talk. So 
I'm giving my talk, I'm in my office, they'll do a lot of education. And I said, when there's, you know, when, when there's a bone out of place, it, put it puts 10, 10 millimeters of mercury pressure about the weight of a dime on a nerve, right? And in the back of my mind, I didn't know if it was myelinated or unmyelinated. Would you believe a hand went up and it was this patient of mine and she was like, <laughs> she was a highly intelligent person. She goes, is that a myelinated nerve? I mean, what are the odds, right? Because it was in my mind, right? The question came up, right? So my point is this, like, get that out of your mind, okay? The second thing is, you know, we talk about criticism and, you know, in chiropractic, for example. Um, the way I've dealt with that is this, and I've had, oh, my neurologist said I should never go to a chiropractor. And right. I would say, tell your, tell your neurologist that your chiropractor said you should never go to a neurologist. And when people would ask me about chiropractic, 99.9% .9 of the world thinks of chiropractic as a, as a modality or a treatment for low back and neck pain and headaches, carpal right. tunnel, those sort of things. They may not necessarily know how that works. So what, what I usually do when somebody says, oh, chiropractors on oh, my back, my neck, and they say something like, like that, which is kind of like what they're assuming what it is. I just simply say, and this is something that I, this is my bit of my roundabout way of getting to some advice. I just, my one word is interesting. I just say interesting. What do you know about chiropractic? And then you mm -hmm. just, then I would just keep it quiet because no, because then they'll say what they think they know about it, right? So they'll express it. I don't care if they're a medical doctor, a neurologist, they already have a preconceived idea of what I do. I know what I do. I know how it affects people. I've done it for 25 years. So it's like, so it's like, it becomes a conversation of just asking, what do you know? And say, oh, that's interesting. Well, I, kind of, but did you know that really chiropractic is about your nervous system? It's about the nervous neural efficiency. And all of a sudden they're interested. And I just was able to shift their paradigm shift, you know, that person, to what we do and understand what we do from a different perspective. And they say, wow, I didn't know that. When you're on purpose and you wanna serve and you know you have something that can help people, you know what, you turn those times, instead of shying away and getting nervous about criticism, figure out a way that you can use that opportunity to with, you know, with empathy and compassion, ex you know, not necessarily put that guy down and have an argument, you know, he's your best friend. The critic in the room is your best friend because they have no idea what you do. You have a passion for it and you're really quick and able to understand and, and express what you do. And if you can do that in literally three, three minutes, then you're going to be greatly successful. And you know what? You practice that because you give those ex explaining what you do. Those talks are really for yourself. It reinforces your philosophy, your purpose and why you do what you do. That's my best advice for the critic. If we boil all that down, it comes down to being an educator, right? It's educating and teaching and giving of yourself to someone else so they can be better informed, know more, be smarter, and go about their day feeling a little bit better about themselves. Dave, this has been a fantastic uh, discussion with you. I love talking to you. You're always very insightful. You've helped me over the years, and you've helped my family. Thank you for that, and uh, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you too, brother. Thank you so much.